It's Chris Dancy, and I'm back for the next set of questions for Manuel Esperanza Baños. And the next question is... ¿Quieres controlarlo o es una adicción? Do you want to control your connectivity or is it an addiction? Addiction, it's... I can understand what people would say it was an addiction. Uh, whenever you hear, like, the number of devices and services that I use, it sounds excessive. Um, I don't feel it's an addiction. I feel it's definitely a crutch or a convenience. There's certain things that I enjoy knowing automatically, uh, where I'm going, when I'm going to be there, uh, how I'm feeling and wondering, you know, controlling or projecting that data into the future. Um, I, I don't think I'm any more addicted to technology than the normal person. I think if anything, I'm more aware of it. I'm more aware of its uh, powers, but that's it. It's not an addiction. We'll go with question cinco. Al dedicar de mismo tiempo a actualizar tu información en línea que otros aspectos de tu vida has desviado. And that means, have you quit some aspects of your life because of your dedication to data? Um, there was a period between 2014 and 2015 where I really didn't have a lot of friends. I wasn't dating. Uh, so I, I quit people. <laughs> Uh, it was just, I found that, you know, people weren't, I didn't really understand how people acted anymore because they, they seemed to be almost autonomous or have some sort of free will. All stuff we take for granted, but to me, I was using so much technology, I really couldn't understand them. Other than that, I mean, there are certain things that, you know, I think if you think about some parts of my life that I quit, I mean, obviously all the health things, um, yeah, it's it's good. It's all it, it all works out in the end. So we'll go with the next question. Según usted, este a, el estar conectado a las redes primero cambió su cuerpo, luego su mentalidad y por último su corazón. ¿Cuál cree usted que fueron los beneficios de estar conectado que hicieron posible este cambio y los prejuicios? In your opinion, um, being connected uh, to network first to change your body after you mentally and finally change your heart. In your opinion, what profits uh, of being connected make this change possible? What prejudices you? Oof. Um, so yeah, it definitely changed my body and then my mind and then my heart. Um, and I think the question really is, you know, uh, what, what in this change made it possible and what made it difficult? Well, I think the thing that made it change was just first the awareness of different systems. So the first, the awareness of my body. So just logging what you eat helps you understand how you eat and when you eat. Next, kind of uh, logging of your activity. Uh, so when you're active and when you're not active. The next part would be logging your sleep. So what helps you sleep, what doesn't help you sleep. And then finally, logging your mindfulness or your spiritual journey, whether you pray or meditate. And I did all of that. So I think there's the... The first thing you have when you have those four areas, nutrition, activity, uh, sleep, and spirituality, is you have a heightened awareness of your own sense of self, first off, because you just understand and, and pay attention to when you're doing these things. The second thing, I think, when you get into what changes your mind, just being aware of things actually makes you more focused. So not only are you aware of your own biological status and your own sleep and everything else, you start to sense other people's. Now this could be uh, some form of digital cognitive bias that's developing humans. I notice a lot of people make assumptions um, about other people now based on the digital exhaust or behavior they observe, not in person, but secondhand through another system. Uh, but I don't think so. I really believe that there are new senses uh, beyond touch, sight, sound, taste, etc. that we're developing because of this. As far as it changing my body, my mind, and then I guess, uh, I'm sorry, my heart, um, I've become more sensitive myself to other people who might be struggling with being on devices or being digitally maybe addicted themselves. So whether they're attached to social media or they're attached to logging their workouts or just attached to, you know, uh, following their friends, you know, obsessively and living vicariously through them. Uh, you know, spiritually I'm more connected and have more empathy for people like that. It used to make me very angry 
when people would just, you know, follow me online and never interact with me. I think people are not to be binge watched. People are to be, inter, you know, interactive with. So, but I'm getting better with that. So that would probably be the last part of that. So we'll do one more question for this segment, and then we'll cut it off. And that question is: Si mal no recuerdo, usted se encontraba trabajando en el pasado, en 2016, en una máquina del tiempo de la información, capaz de uh, recopilar datos de la actividad de las personas. ¿Podría contarnos un poco más acerca de este proyecto? In 2016, you were working on a time machine of data, quote unquote. Um, uh, can you give us uh, about information for people? Could you tell us more about that project? So, yes, uh, I'm actually doing my first talk about time and data in May in Sweden, in Stockholm, Sweden, at the Biohacker Summit. Um, basically, during that time, I was looking at the difference between memory and nostalgia. So the data that makes up memories is very similar to the data that makes up nostalgia, yet nostalgia is somehow different. So what is it when you remember something fondly and it's a really good memory and it almost transports you to you in time, what is that difference? That's, that's absent when you actually just objectively remember, uh, remember something. Um, and what I found is it really, there's a, point in, there's a point of time in which you judge everything through. We call this lens now. And the now lens is, is very much one of these things, depending on your state of mind, with a bunch of factors, your rest, your, your mood, uh, the type of food you'd eat, and stuff like that changes. So sometimes if you're in a really great mood, you could say it's because of a bunch of things. Some people just blame the weather. But ultimately, that subjective experience comes from how you're perceiving time at that moment. So you'll notice if you've ever been sad or depressed, time seems to go slow and it seems like it'll never happen. And when you're really happy, time seems to speed up. But additionally, you are also looking forward to time. We, we often say, I'm looking forward to that event. And some people say, I'm dreading that event. So the first way that I've seen that memory changes from nostalgia is really when it comes down to how we refer to events in the past or refer to the events in the, in the future. But more importantly, when we record the data of now, how it's recorded, if it's biased in some way. So uh, I'll talk more about this at my talk, but there are certain tools that I employ to help me become more future-oriented or past-oriented. Uh, so basically, almost like you would fast forward in a program or bin, you know, scrub something or skip commercials, doing that with my life. So my fiance and I, we spend a lot of time doing interesting things, but I mean, you could easily say that for us, time is super compressed. So what we do in just a few days could seem like months of activity for everyone else. Now, that being said, I think everybody is experiencing an exponential nature in how time is accelerating. Doesn't matter what age you are or how you're living. I think the difference really is some people have a more positive experience with this acceleration and some people have a negative acceler uh, experience. And I think people like me are, are working diligently on understanding the subtle nuances of th this time shift that we're all experiencing uh, might be at the forefront of something. Um, I say if you really want to understand how time and data works, you have to look at a couple different things. So first is this concept of coincidence. So when two things just happen, it uh, seems kind of magical. Um, that's interesting. That's, you know, there's a lot of cognitive bias that goes into coincidence. But the next thing that, beyond coincidence, so the next level up is um, something called serendipity. And serendipity is when you have a coincidence, but it meets an opportunity. So you have something that you're looking forward to, and then there's a major coincidence that actually forces that opportunity faster to you. Uh, or it's an opportunity you didn't know you were going to have, but then it presents itself and you're like, it just aligns with a huge coincidence in your life. Uh, meeting a friend unexpectedly is serendipitous. Beyond serendipity, um, you really have um, this idea of uh, what Carl Jung called um, synchronicity. And synchronicity is really when multiple events external to you align with your own life. And it's only through synchronicity and times of great kind of alignment that you start to find patterns that help you see almost a wormhole through to the future. So if you start to notice synchronicity, just like people who want to practice dreaming and practice lucid dreaming will have certain steps they do before they go to bed, like writing down the words, I'm going to remember what I'm, what I'm dreaming, and then waking up and writing everything down immediately. That's an exercise to help you learn to uh, lucid dream better. There are exercises you can do to force synchronicity 
uh, into your life, and that's part of time hacking that I'll also talk about in Sweden. So hopefully that answers a little bit of a question on time hacking, and this video went way too long, so we're going to stop it, and we'll be back with part... Uno, dos, tres, tres.